Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Katrina Davis, and I'm a family advocate at Seattle Children's Autism Center. You'll probably hear some conviction in my voice tonight as I introduce our, um, uh, this presentation. I have a t son who's 20, and we've had a rough year. So he's, he's, in, he's exactly what we're talking around, the need for high-level crisis stabilization supports. So I welcome you all to the Autism 200 series. Uh, tonight's our much anticipated panel series titled Crisis Stabilization Services for the Autism and Intellectual Disability Community. Before I introduce Dr. Bolter, our moderator for tonight, I have a few announcements. Welcome to everyone in this room. We've gone Facebook Live in the last few years, and so our live audience has dwindled because people watch it from home, but what a great turnout tonight. Thank you for being here. And I, I am welcoming our, those of us joining us via Seattle Children's Facebook live stream. This topic has generated a huge amount of interest, and we do expect a very large live, uh, live stream audience, uh, probably in the thousands. So thank you. You might not know that previous Autism 200 series are all viewable online. So any presentation we've done over the last several years is viewable. Uh, just go to Seattle Children's Autism 200, just Google that, and you can click the viewable online past lectures, including tonight's lecture, which should be up on YouTube in about three weeks, and on Facebook Live by tomorrow, maybe even now. Um, this is a recorded event. Our panelists have given us consent to being recorded, but if you make a comment or ask a question, uh, you're giving consent to also live online for eternity. Uh, given the complexity of this topic tonight, we are not going to have a Q&A session at the end. We've decided to forego that Q&A session because of the, we really want to give our panelists maximum time to answer the many questions many parents, individuals, advocates, providers have sent to us. So we've collected a lot of really good questions. If you have a burning question and, uh, and you're here tonight in the audience, our kind panelists are going to stay after a little bit and you can ask them a question. Those of us joining live stream, go ahead and send your question on the comments and we'll do our best to get back to you in a timely manner. Tonight's content is aimed at individuals with severe autism and intellectual disability who are eligible for DDA services. For those of you that um, have a loved one or yourself are not enrolled in DDA, you're going to find a lot of this information helpful tonight. And please know that we, we are fully aware that the same problems exist for our non-DDA enrolled autism population. So we plan to hold a similar session at the Autism 200 series in 2020. We welcome feedback and input from our non-DDA enrolled autism population to craft that session. Tonight's really important. In this room, we have a panel of caring professionals, advocates, providers, and experts who care deeply for our community. They're very much aware of the profound problem with our existing crisis stabilization services. Their presence at one table is beautiful. It's a symbol of collaboration, the concern they have, and the hope toward real solutions. It's important to note that our effort, there are other efforts going around in our state right now to address the unethical problem of limited and in some cases non-existent crisis stabilization services for individuals with autism and intellectual disability who are experiencing severe behavior or mental health crisis. We're going to hear more about some of those efforts tonight. Our goal for the panel is to learn more about the problem, what's being done now and what we need to do in the future, and what many of you are asking, what can you do to join the call to action to improve the lives of individuals and families who are currently suffering? Before I introduce Dr. Bolter, I'd like to make a quick shout out to Donna Patrick, who's hopefully joining us via li live stream today or tomorrow. Donna is a public uh, policy director at Washington State Developmental Disabilities Council and has advocated tirelessly over the years to improve the lives of those individuals with intellectual disability in our community. Many of us have witnessed Donna tirelessly advocate in Olympia, taking names <laughs> and whatever. What's the other? I don't know. Taking names and that other thing. Um, <laughs> She, uh, she works really hard to change the hearts and minds, informing our elected officials of the most pressing needs in our community. This last legislative session, Donna and other advocates put crisis services on the map. Effectively raising awareness and proposing solutions leads to funding and policy change and real solutions. There will be ways for you to get involved and join the call to action. And we'll talk more about those tonight. Don is being honored at the annual Arc of King County's gala event in October. For those of you um, who would like to support the Arc of King County, who does amazing work to advocate for our community and to celebrate Donna's achievements and her
her dedication to our community, please go to the Ark of King County website to learn more. It's in October. Now let me introduce Dr. Bolter, our moderator for tonight. Eric Bolter is a licensed psychologist and licensed behavior analyst in the state of Washington. He received his PhD from University of Iowa in 2004. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at John Hopkins University School of Medicine and the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Following his fellowship, he became a faculty member at Kennedy Krieger Institute. In 2010, Dr. Bolter moved his, to his current position as a clinical supervisor of the biobehavior program at Seattle Children's Autism Center. Dr. Bolter is clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington. His research and practice focusing on the use of applied behavioral analysis, or ABA, to assess and treat individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities who engage in severe and disruptive behavior. Please welcome Dr. Bolter. Thank you, Katrina. So as uh, Katrina has, has said, we're gonna talk tonight about crisis support for individuals um, with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities that have complex behavioral and mental health needs. And before I go any further, I do wanna uh, say that I'm the one standing up here doing this right now, moderating, but uh, behind the scenes, Katrina and Jim Mancini did a ton of work to pull this together and to make this work tonight. So I wanna give a shout out to them uh, for their efforts uh, in putting this together. I wanna just echo some of Katrina's uh, earlier statements also in thanking this panel for being here. Um, we're not gonna solve everything tonight, but I think having all of these great folks at the table together talking about uh, crisis services for this targeted population of individuals and uh, you know thinking about ideas and about improving that system and moving forward is a, is a nice first start so thank you panel um, for being here I also want to say thank you to everybody in the auditorium and everybody online for participating in this this uh, what we feel is a very important uh, subject to be able to talk about All right, so I wanna start by just talking a little bit about, uh, Katrina mentioned it a little bit, but I'll uh, put a point on it. Um, uh, the group that we're talking about tonight are individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, with or without autism, who are uh, experiencing mental and behavioral health crises. Uh, these are individuals uh, that qualify for DDA, and the type of crises uh, that these individuals um, uh, have, have or are experiencing are, uh, are things like uh, behavioral issues with severe aggression, property destruction, non-self-injurious non self-injury, uh, or excuse me, non-suicidal self-injury and other issues that require high levels of care. Um, and as uh, Katrina also mentioned, we will be putting together an Autism 200 uh, later in 2020 to talk about uh, a group of individuals with autism who don't qualify for DDA but also experience crisis. We recognize that this is a focused group tonight, so uh, look for that in, in 2020. I'll start tonight by opening up and just giving some brief comments about current services for individuals with IDD and severe behavior, uh, and also some brief comments then about the barriers and gaps and deficits in those, in those services. And then we'll move on to our panel, uh, where we're gonna talk a lot more in depth about it uh, with the experts uh, at their respective agencies on this issue uh, and talk about kind of moving uh, towards solutions. And then we'll end tonight with uh, kind of a call to action, how you can get involved, advocacy uh, information. Before I go any further, however, there's all these great people up here, so I wanna introduce them. Uh, David O'Neill, who is um, the IDD Service Director at Behavioral Health Agency for Sound Health, we have Arzu Faro, who is the president and chief executive for the Washington Autism Alliance and Advocacy. We have Elizabeth uh, Landry, who is a staff attorney at the Northwest Justice Project. Uh, we have Beth uh, Leonard, who is legal counsel for the Office of uh, Developmental Disability Ombuds. Stacy Dim, who is the executive director for ARC of King County. Uh, Beth Crable, who is the Acting Chief of Medicaid Eligibility for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. Gail Krieger, who is the Section Manager for Medicaid Compliance um, for Medicaid. 
and Gary Stoby, who is the uh, clinical associate professor and the medical director for the University of Washington Adult Autism Clinic. So thank you again, panel, for being here. So uh, starting out by just giving a brief overview of some current services uh, for uh, this group of individuals, uh, Medicaid offers some community-based behavioral health outpatient agencies, um, uh, again, community-based services in, um, uh, to address mental health and behavioral health needs. Uh, there are also uh, community network the community network program in King County that offers some crisis stabilization supports um, in the form of some day programs and other crisis services. Uh, there's, uh, Medicaid also has uh, been in situations where they have sent individuals out of state before uh, because of the lack of more intensive inpatient um, settings for uh, individuals with uh, IED and autism uh, who are in crisis. Uh, DDA also offers services in the form of uh, community crisis stabilization services. Uh, they have three beds uh, where individuals can be placed for a handful of months. Um, there's also an enhanced respite service that has a few locations around Washington uh, that might be able to place individuals for uh, a few weeks. Um, and uh, other behavioral supports and, con and behavioral consultation, depending on that level of waiver, uh, services that you might have within the context of DDA. Um, there's also um, the case that individuals uh, and family members, uh, when they uh, seek out services for an individual with IDD that is having a crisis, are told to call 911 or to take that individual to an emergency department or to talk to a DDA case manager for supports and so forth. And some of these actions might lead to having that individual placed um, in, for instance, a, the Children's Long-Term Mental Health Inpatient Program, which is the CLIP program, which is a state-run inpatient psychiatric facility, um, or maybe um, have an inpatient uh, stay at a private hospital, such as Seattle Children's Inpatient Unit. Those are meant for relatively short five through seven day kinds of stays. Um, and sometimes these individuals are also, uh, due to lack of um, beds for them to go to in the state or other locations, end up having uh, prolonged boarding in emergency departments, um, you know, sometimes several days, uh, where they're stuck uh, in, in the ED room, there's no place to go for them. Uh, and then there, there's also, um, the issue that some uh, care providers uh, either choose to or the, a, an individual just didn't qualify for admission, but one way or the other, they end up taking that individual home uh, in a state that is medicated, isolated, and continues to have unsafe behaviors towards self and others, and they're kind of stuck in that situation when they're bringing them home. So those are some of the the services and some of the issues and just to kind of continue on some of the over overarching problems and there might be some services here uh, that uh, have some more nuance to them uh, and or things that were missed in that opening but luckily I have a whole panel of people to back me up here so when we get to questions they're going to be able to fill in any of those gaps for me um, but other other as we kind of transition to looking at an overview of the problem um, I've started to talk a little bit about them, but you know, overall, crisis services across all systems in the state have very limited capacity relative to the need. So many, many of these uh, different services, uh, as hard as they might try, have long wait lists, and there's a huge capacity uh, that's that's not that's not met because of the limited uh, service compared to what's needed. Um, the overall scope of the problem. Uh, is not necessarily well understood yet in the sense of just data collection across the state to truly understand uh, the, the scope of the problem and the best way to address it. So there's some, there's some uh, shortfalls there as well. Um, placement in settings, when individuals do get placed in settings, so for example, an inpatient setting, um, many times the, that staff um, and that, that inpatient program might not be set up 
uh, necessarily for those individuals with intellectual and developmental disability, uh, with severe behavior and autism. Um, and so that staff working with them are not trained or, or are very minimally trained to work with that, that, that group of individuals. Uh, there's a lack of preventative services out there to, that could head off crisis. So things like uh, various community-based services, in-home services, outpatient clinics, intensive outpatients, partial hospitalization, uh, these types of services that uh, are specifically focused on uh, this, this population aren't there uh, or they're in very limited capacity. Um, you, can, you, can see, you can see the trend here of these things kind of dovetailing into each other. Uh, there's also the lack of special, uh, specialized interdisciplinary intensive settings, uh, such as specialized inpatient units, as I just mentioned for, the, for some of these individuals. And because of the lack of some of these services um, and these kind of interdisciplinary coordinated crisis supports, what happens many times is it puts stressors on different areas of of the system. And the example that we have up here uh, at the bottom of the screen is, um, for example, psychiatrists that gets uh, put in a position where they're the one part of what should be a comprehensive team working with an individual and there's no other pieces available. So there's a psychiatrist trying to manage some of these behaviors with, with medications, but there's no behavioral support, there's no speech, there's no OT, there's none of these other services uh, that that individual might need. And so these providers get an, an enormous amount of stress placed on them to manage all of, the, all of what's going on in that individual's life, life by themselves when really it kind of takes this collective team. So that's, that's another consequence. And as we talk about specialized inpatient units, I just wanted to pull up an article from 2012 from Matt Siegel's group. Um, and in 2011, they, they did a survey of specialized uh, pediatric inpatient units in the United States, and they came up with nine, um, six of, uh, in, in, that were spread across six states. And uh, since uh, this article, there now is one in Colorado um, to note, but I just put this up because what this shows is, uh, as you can see, the vast majority of those nine programs are in the Upper East Coast. So there's, a, there's, there's kind of a great need for this within our state, but kind of more generally across the country. All right, um, continuing on. Um, some of the other um, issues that have popped up with, with crisis services are also lack of residential options, um, that things like high levels of staff turnover and residential placement limit the ability of those places to actually maintain staff. That can be for various reasons uh, that, that can be uh, are to do with um, the, tr the uh, ability to train those staff appropriately to work with this population of individuals. Um, pay issues, low pay, those types of things. There's an overall shortage of specialized providers to do this work in general, including that training that needs to be done for everybody else. Um, there's a lack of coordinated continuum of step up and step down services, this idea of a continuum uh, of care where individuals can move up or down that continuum is based on, on the, their needs, uh, but, but it's, it's somewhat coordinated. Um, there's lack of support uh, to family members who also experience crisis, right? So if an individual is having significant and chronic crisis, the family goes through that with them and, 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 and lack of support for those, those family members. And again, this all kind of leads to uh, a fragmented and an uneven distribution of services across the state. So uh, there's a lot to work on. And um, where we, everybody here recognizes that. And so now we're gonna kind of start to move into our next uh, section, which is our, our panel. So uh, we're gonna kind of try to dive into this, talk a little bit more about it, and uh, see if we can kind of move, move some of this forward in, in kind of a solution and positive way to uh, discuss some of these issues. All right, so here's our panel again. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with our first question, which is for David. And uh, there it is. <clears throat> and the question is, uh, what is the nature of crisis? Why does it arise? And what are common factors that create a crisis situation? David? Crisis is terrifying. 
is, I guess, the quickest um, summary I can come up with, Eric. Um, it, it's a scary thing. Everyone feels terrible. Uh, nobody thinks clearly. Um, no one's really at their best. And this includes even the, the responders and the helpers, because a lot of people, I think, don't know what's going on or, or don't know why this is occurring. Um, we really try not to define crisis. You know, there's, it's up to the individual. Everyone has different abilities, skills, emotions, history that they bring to this. Um, we've had crisis referrals where somebody is um, throwing paper across the room. And you think, well, that doesn't sound very dangerous. But um, certainly it, it triggered something. In the we have other parents who maybe show up at the emergency room and they say, oh, I'm sorry that we're here, um, but you know, my son had become aggressive and the person has two broken ribs, right? So you can have these huge ranges of, of crisis. And the way that I've taken on to define it, I, I learned from a woman named Joni Beasley, and she said, a crisis is a problem without the tools to address it. So no matter what it is, if you don't have the right tool, you are probably not gonna be able to fix it, right? And I, I take that a step further, is that you might even have a tool. You have a mental health crisis line. You have a crisis respite bed. You have an ABA provider. But it may not be appropriate for the crisis that you're having, right? I mean, it's great if I go to Home Depot and just grab one of those cool tools off the wall because they all look awesome, right? And if I don't know how to use it and I don't know what it's for, it's not a very helpful tool either, right? Um, I think that uh, another thing in the nature of crisis is that it's very limiting. By the time you've gotten to a crisis situation, things have gotten expensive. <laughs> things have gotten um, you know, damaging. Uh, the responses traditionally are restrictive in nature. Um, it's hospitalization. Um, Eric already mentioned the, the psychiatric medication comes in as a component. Um, without understanding the etiology of the actual crisis, so it's very simplistic in that um, you, know, you only have a couple of things you could do. There's a, sort of a black and white answer here. You don't have a lot of time to suss out the gray. Um, a crisis should be infrequent. If it's frequent, it means there's a problem in your support plan. Right? There's a problem in what we're doing and what we're noticing and what we're not noticing. Um, when we talk about why it arises and some of the common factors, um, there's some uh, neurocognitive, social, emotional challenges that many individuals with IDD have. And that makes things like um, acutely stressful changes um, a big deal. Uh, the, that baseline profile of not being able necessarily to handle a lot of social emotional changes. We talk about grief. We talk about um, a staff turnover. We talk about um, changes in schedule. You, you see a lot of these programs that go, but that's because those um, changes are stressful. Um, that results in a bunch of disruptive responses, right? When someone's system is disrupted. And that's actually one of the main reasons we see crises occur, right? It's these changes that aren't recognized. We get somebody to an emergency room and we'll ask, well, what has changed? Has anything changed in this person's life? And they'll say, no, this just came out of the blue, right? But nothing comes out of the blue. So we use this uh, tool developed by Dr. Lori Sharlow. It's called the Recent Stressors Questionnaire. And it helps walk people through what changes have happened. What am I looking at here? Are there things that I can find? Um, the second most common factor is medical concerns. Um, people with intellectual developmental disabilities have a lot of medical comorbidities. And those often get ignored. Um, the, I, I would say that this leads to something that we call diagnostic overshadowing. It means that if somebody has an intellectual developmental disability, that is the cause of all of their problems. Um, I often think that we, well, we've actually had this happen. A woman went into an emergency room, um, had been having, you know, falling down and refusing to move, um, laying down in streets, curbs, sidewalks, things like this. This became very distressing to the system. Um, and of course, that they got her into the hospital talked about all the medications that she might need or the things that, um, that first responders might be doing in the future, she had a broken femur, right? That wasn't even considered, right? This could be why the person's falling, why they're sitting down in the middle of the street. Um, but medical things, if someone with intellectual and disability, developmental disabilities is having discomfort, if they're having odd sensations, if they're having pain, all these things that 
that happen in the body when we're experiencing some sort of medical problem causes crisis. Great, thanks David. All right, our next question is uh, for our zoo, Furrow. Individuals with IDD and mental health issues often do not currently have a medical home. What do you see as the outcomes when these individuals don't have a medical home? Can this lead to crisis? And within the context of that question, go ahead and explain what you mean by medical home and why it's important here. A um, medical home is an approach to providing comprehensive, high quality primary care. A medical home should be the following. It should be accessible, care that is easy for the person and the family to obtain, including geographic access and insurance accommodation. It should be family-centered. The family is recognized and acknowledged as the primary caregiver and support for the person ensuring that medical decisions are made in true partnership with the family. It should be continuous. The, the same primary care clinicians care for the person from infancy through young adulthood, providing assistance and support as they transition to adult care. It should be comprehensive. Preventative primary and specialty care are provided to the person and their family. And it should be coordinated. A care plan is created in partnership with the family and it's communicated with all health healthcare clinicians and necessary agencies and organizations. And it should be compassionate. Genuine concern for the well-being of the person and their family should be emphasized and addressed. And it should be culturally effective. The family and the person, their culture, their language, their beliefs, and their traditions should be recognized, valued, and respected. A medical home is not about a place. It extends beyond walls and clinical practice. It builds partnership with clinical specialists, families, and community resources. It recognizes that the family is a constant in a person's life, and it emphasizes partnership between healthcare professionals and families. We seem to be in the middle of a perfect storm. There's increase in children with IDD and mental health disorders. Pediatricians with little to no training serving them, specialists, Developmental pediatricians and child psychiatrists are in short supply. There are associated medical conditions, as you mentioned, that are not getting diagnosed and treated in a timely manner, causing persons with IDD and mental health disorders to have to use behavior to communicate underlying medical conditions. So these persons are less likely to experience care within a medical home. They have more unmet medical and support needs. There is a higher caregiver stress. There is higher rate of family financial and employment stress. More likely to be hospitalized with ambulatory care. And I think having a medical home mitigates adverse child and family outcomes. There's shared decision making associated with greater satisfaction with care and improved guidance regarding treatment and difficult issues. Programs providing case management, longer visits, coordination with behavioral and mental health providers is associated with reduced hospitalization, higher satisfaction, and decreased unmet needs. Yes, I can. <laughs> I want to make sure to be close enough to the uh, microphone. Is this good? This, OK. Um, so I work at Northwest Justice Project, which is a civil legal aid program in the state of Washington. It's a statewide program. And here in the Seattle office, we have uh, one of our units is a medical legal partnership. And we have a number of attorneys who uh, work closely with folks at Children's through that. Um, so I guess the, the, the first thing I would say is people do not contact us when things are going well. Um, that said, it is alarming how common it is for us to hear from parents of children or young adults 
with developmental disabilities who are in crisis and need intensive services right away to prevent institutionalization. So uh, families do not contest, contact us when the situation is just a little bit bad. They likely contact their DDA case managers then asking for help only when DDA seems unwilling or unable to assist the family do, then they contact us and look for a lawyer. Um, so I just want to quickly um, sort of give one uh, sort of composite case. This isn't any sort of smushed together a bunch of the examples, just to give an example of the kinds of um, situations that we see. Um, we were contacted by a mother of a, a young, a, well, he was a sort of teenage boy um, who had uh, developmental delays and had developed uh, severe behavioral uh, challenges. And um, she was trying to uh, get residential behavior support for her son. Um, he had assaulted her landing her in the emergency room. And as part of the assault, um, he had kicked her uh, in the stomach and she was pregnant. So she was uh, very fearful uh, of bringing him back home without supports, uh, keeping him at home without supports to move him through the crisis um, and also keeping her pregnancy safe for the unborn child. Um, at that point, uh, DDA had told her that uh, 130 hours per month of personal care services should be enough to uh, manage his uh, crisis and keep him at home. And uh, she was told that she at least needed to try that approach and only if it failed um, would the, could DDA look at other services service options. Um, she was unwilling to take this risk and, uh, and the, the son went into some residential placements that, that were mentioned. Um, I think they were the short term, uh, three or four weeks out in Spokane uh, sort of places. And, um, but she wasn't ready to bring him back because she still didn't have the supports. And so although it broke her heart to do so, she simply did not pick him up. That, and uh, at that point, Child Protective Services uh, got involved, the Division of Children Youth Family Services got involved, and they started oh, a dependency proceeding, which was not ideal, but um, but at least the uh, boy was able to get his, um, his services, residential supports through the uh, child protective systems. Um, so I just quickly wanted to say that, um, of course, for young adults, there are no child protective services. Um, and this crisis is getting a lot of press. Uh, you know, it's out in the general um, knowledge. We're hearing stories, I think it's just in the last two weeks on NPR about this difficulty of people not being able to go home. And I just wanted to emphasize the human consequences we see of uh, parents who are, feel compelled to abandon their children um, because they can't get the supports they need. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> All right, uh, Beth Leonard, the next question is for you. Can you describe how the DD Ombuds became aware of the lack of crisis services issue and how they responded? Yes, I can. Hi, everyone. My name is Beth. I work at the Office of the Developmental Disability Ombuds. Um, for, the, for those of you that don't know, that is a statewide advocacy organization that does both individual advocacy and systemic work for people with uh, intellectual disabilities across the state of Washington, both children and adults. Um, it was created in 2016, so fairly new. Um, and one of our main advocacy strategies is we respond to complaints that are filed with our office from the public, from the community. 
So we opened in 27, or 2017, and in early 2018, we started to get complaints about people with developmental disabilities that were stuck in the hospital. Um, and what I mean by stuck in the hospital is that they, people were either in a medical hospital or a psychiatric hospital and been declared ready to discharge by their medical staff and had nowhere to go. And so um, we were encountering people that had been lingering in these hospital settings, either you know, being boarded in ERs or other areas of the hospital um, for three weeks up to a year um, worth of time waiting to get out of the hospital even though they had no medical reason to be there. Um, in response to that, we opened a, a larger investigation to see what was going on, and that's how, we, um, real, that's how we came to realize how significant this issue of lack of crisis supports for the developmental disability community is in Washington State. What we discovered when we looked into this more deeply is that everyone that was stuck in the hospital had come from a community setting of some kind before they were hospitalized, which means they were successfully living at home with their parents or another family relative or in a residential service setting, so a licensed or certified setting, um, prior to their hospitalization. And what had occurred for those individuals and families is a change in the individual with disabilities behavior or an escalation in their behavior um, that was unable to be interrupted. So in most situations we looked into, the family or the service provider had been asking for help, asking for crisis interventions, and was unable to access anything or um, at least access enough that they were able to prevent the crisis and the hospitalization from taking place. Um, and those families and service providers got to a point where they could no longer serve the individual safely, and so I ended up taking them to the hospital for evaluation, and then were unable to bring them back because they didn't feel like they could support the individual safely at home. Um, we discovered that for many of the reasons that uh, David described earlier, um, people were, were ending up in these out of control situations due to um, lack of availability of the crisis services in the, um, in the community, the DDA, the state provided services, or from not, not having access to a provider that could diagnose a medical issue, not having access to a dentist that could do something about dental pain, not having access to behavior communication support to help the individual communicate what was going on. So in, in response to this issue of hospitals being used as crisis placements, the DD Ombuds issued a report called Stuck in the Hospital um, that was uh, released in December of 2018 um, to help uh, facilitate these conversations with policymakers and stakeholders across the state. Um, so with that report, we were able to collaborate with other stakeholders and advocacy organizations across the state um, and have started to engage in conversations with uh, legislators, um, people from the governor's office, and also the state agencies in hopes that we can find some solutions to this problem and work on um, enhancing the availability of crisis services so we can prevent these hospitalizations from occurring. Great. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. All right, next question is for you, Stacy. Many of the topics discussed so far focus on the child in crisis or the individual in crisis. However, uh, a child in crisis impacts the entire family. What are the current supports in place for parents and care providers, and how can those be improved? Sure, thank you. It might be a short answer, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so my name is Stacy Dim, and I'm the executive director of the ARC of King County. And for those of you not familiar with the ARC system, it's, an, it's a national organization that promotes and protects the human and civil rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it was formed by families. There were families that came together to raise awareness about issues for their children. And it was that, that was the case in the 1930s when children were sort of automatically institutionalized when they had very significant disabilities. That's the case now. Um, you see at this panel, there are plenty of issues still left for advocacy and for families to get together to talk about how we solve some of these chronic issues and how we provide supports to families. So in King County, we have um, a, a state chapter and we have um, seven chapters across the state. Um, we try to focus a lot on how we support families. They, if you have a, a concern and you call 211 or you call another organization and they understand that you have a child with a developmental disability, they'll refer them to us. And we, we certainly hear from a lot from families around this issue. And unfortunately, um, sometimes we hear the child, by the time a first responder comes or the child gets some support, they actually may be stable, but the family remains in crisis. And so we know that they experience this um, pretty deeply. Probably one of the most important things as a family is that you not 
remain isolated, that you reach out, that you talk with other individuals. Um, we have a, a program, for example, called Parent to Parent that allows parents who have sort of already been through something you might be going through to connect with those parents um, who are experiencing issues now. Uh, there's nothing more profound than talking with someone else who's been through what you've been going through um, and then trying to help you problem solve or at least be a good listening ear. In addition, um, we have services across the state for families to access respites, primarily designed for families to get support and a break from the caregiving that they provide. Being a primary caregiver can be very difficult, very isolating, even with when you have uh, two, two primary caregivers in a household, sometimes they get isolated from each other. Um, we know that for families who have kids with disabilities, there's a very high rate of divorce, a very high rate of stress, People are sleep deprived. People have significant stressors in their lives. So it's important that you make a point to develop community around, build your own community around you um, and reach out to other families. And if you need help doing that, you can do that through the ARC. Um, you can call your case manager and help them get you connected um, in a variety of ways. Uh, I think that it's probably most important for families to um, also be aware of some of the systematic change that you can powerfully engage in, and that is simply in the form of calling your legislator, making sure you share your story with policymakers, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, I think, throughout the panel. But um, if you've never thought you would ever be politically involved, and you're here in this room tonight because you're experiencing this particular problem, it's the time. Um, there's no question, it's the time for you to learn how to contact your legislator and tell your story um, because it's the most powerful thing we can do at this point. Thank you, Stacy. All right, uh, next question is for Beth Crable. How can DDA help families who are in crisis now and what can families expect from DDA and their case manager when in crisis? Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm so glad Stacy mentioned uh, the respite services that the ARC offers. Um, the respite that DDA offers is one of the most important preventive services. Um, it's important that families take advantage of that. We have two types of respite. We have hourly respite. It can be in-home. We also have out-of-home respite in a licensed setting. When a family's in a crisis, we're not necessarily the agency that's that's responding to that crisis. Um, as I mentioned, that preventive service is so critical, but after the crisis, what we have to offer is hopefully additional respite, because for that child or adult to return home, that family is, as Stacy said, is going to have a much higher stress level ongoing. Other services we offer, enhanced uh, stabilization, they're called enhanced respite beds, they're around the state. Uh, for adults, we have what's called diversion beds. The intention is to divert um, placement or admission to a, a psychiatric hospital because that is the population we're talking about. Hopefully we can um, divert that person and keep them in the community and either they go home or they go to a residential setting that can better meet their needs. For families in crisis around the state, we also have um, services, one called staff and family consultation. It can be used to provide uh, family members training around that person's needs. Um, it can be more preventive, of course. Hopefully we're in there earlier to, to reduce the occurrence of these situations, but also afterwards. Because when the person's returning home, they're probably not back to their baseline. Um, because one of the things we don't have much of right now are step-down facilities. So the person is discharging directly to the family home, probably still not at their typical self, for sure. Other things we have to offer, positive behavior support. Um, that's commonly offered to either supplement ABA or instead of ABA. Um, it's a different approach, um, but it's commonly used to help mitigate those things. But again, what we're offering is hopefully more preventive measures and then more crisis stabilization after the fact. 
Great. Thank you, Beth. All right. The next question here is for Gail. What are current services available to healthcare authority to help severe behavior in the IDD population? Um, the healthcare authority is responsible for approximately 2.1 million people in the state of Washington that are Medicaid eligible, of which about um, 1.7 of those individuals are covered by managed care, and the remainder is um, covered by the fee-for-service program. So between the fee-for-service program and the managed care organizations, the healthcare authority is responsible for the medical the behavioral health and the dental benefits that an individual individual might need who has IDD. Um, this means that we would pay for their provider visits. Um, that would include well child checks for children up to the age of 20, according to the Bright Futures guideline. Um, that gives us the opportunity to identify services that conditions that require services and make a referral for those services. Um, so that people, children with depression, children who may have um, autism, who have a developmental disability um, other than autism, can be identified, um, that service, that need can be identified and they can be referred for appropriate services. Um, we also have mental health services, as I explained before. Um, an individual who could be having a, a severe behavior or a crisis intervention um, need could go to a behavioral health agency and receive services. They could call the behavioral um, services hotline that was referred to earlier and to find access to a behavioral health provider. Then if you are enrolled with managed care, you could also call your managed care organization. Um, they will help direct you to the service that you need. Um, the managed care organizations also provide case management. So if a parent were to call a managed care organization and request a case manager, case manager would be back in touch with that parent and um, help that parent navigate the benefits and the provider network. Um, we also have the healthcare authority has a program that was created in the last couple of years called WISE which is a team of behavioral health providers um, on a wide diversity in regards to skill set and um, expertise that work with families and with children um, to provide behavioral health services, resources, um, help connect them with other resources in the community, do case management, and providing um, care and um, therapeutic intervention. We also have um, the Applied Behavioral Analysis Program, which Beth referred to a second ago with the acronym ABA. Um, it is the benefit that is covered under um, our state plan for the treatment of autism or related behaviors um, or diagnoses for which um, it would be um, evidence-based as the treatment um, of, of choice. Um, with the ABA program, we reimburse for licensed individuals to provide that service. Um, we are currently working with some um, educational systems and districts to talk about how to reimburse for that service in the schools. Um, ABA is available um, for community services in a person's home, child's home, um, as well as being available in clinical settings. Um, different providers have opted to provide it in different ways. And so we're supporting that um, variation in choice. We also have um, those providers are also doing group um, parent trainings um, when it's a better approach or in lieu of one-to-one uh, -one when it's available or not available. Um, I think it's important to mention that um, with the behavioral health services program, Stacy talked about support for families. Um, our mental health benefit now includes um, support and treatment for parents and guardians. So, and that can be billed to Medicaid if the child is enrolled. So an, an adult might not have access to those services. And if you have a child um, that is enrolled with Medicaid, your, that provider can um, treat that that parent or that guardian render them services and bill Medicaid using that child's um, Medicaid number. So um, that was a new change that we made under the Affordable Care Act in 2014. Um, we also, of course, would cover those services that um, 
for those situations where someone goes to the emergency room or ends up in the inpatient setting when that's the level of care that's needed. Um, those services would be covered as well. Um, recently, we began to reimburse for inpatient autism services out of state. Um, we do not have a program that um, meets the need for that level of care um, in Washington state. And so we have several children that we have um, connected with providers are in uh, different states who have very um, good programs that are approximately four to six months in treatment. It's all case specific in regards to how that child responds to that intervention. And we have transportation benefit that we pay for that child to, to um, fly to that state and that center. Um, parents would be, travel would be reimbursed because we need to support that return home so that parents can be part of that training. Um, and this is just something that we just started doing in the last um, six to seven months. Um, we have numerous children who are on waiting lists, but we are creating a connection with these, um, with these providers um, and, and in the states that are fortunate enough to have this resource available to them. Um, so I think that's great. Thank you, Gail. All right, last on our table but not least is Gary. This uh, question is for you. How do we scale up services to address the great need in the state, and what type of data do we need to gather to get a better picture of the crisis problem? Well, I, uh, when I saw this uh, question, uh, made a couple initial thoughts. You know, it made me first think about when I was thinking about scale up services, I was trying to think of a service that we already have an adequate amount of, and I couldn't come up with any. Uh, you know, when I think about uh, every specialty uh, that, that serves these children and adults, um, you know, I, we don't have enough. Um, and I worry that we'll never have enough specialists. Um, even within our specialty fields, like in uh, psychiatry and neurology, psychology, um, a large percentage, probably the majority of our prior providers do not feel adequately trained to work with individuals with developmental disabilities who have these mental health crises. Um, let alone the training of the primary care providers that we're asking to be the, the drivers of these medical homes. Um, so, so, you know, yes, we need more providers, but somehow we need to distribute the knowledge more effectively uh, to get the knowledge into the hands of the providers that can uh, interface with these families before the crises. You know, I, you know, you don't, you don't solve, you don't uh, treating a fever with Tylenol and then sending home and not identifying the cause and the root cause of the of the fever isn't your adequate treatment, right? And I think we all recognize that this. In your, you, you know, you use this term very well about continuum of care. And you know we're hearing about yeah even if we had enough crisis beds, well those crisis beds are are an example of of the lack of this continuum of care uh, across the need. So I think when I think about the data, uh, you know, the, on how much do we need across this continuum, uh, you know, I think about um, we don't even have the basic data of, to scope the problem. Uh, you know, I think Beth. You know, you guys did good work on this, but we don't know the number. You know, we don't know the volume. Um, you know, to be able to address. Um, but then, even I think, in more importantly, or as important, um, is within those individuals that hit crises, we need to understand where, what's the earliest that we can see the sign that a crisis is coming, so that we can intervene and steer away from the crisis event. Um, and then recognize what sort of preventive steps need to be put in place, you know, to go forward to prevent those crises. So, so some way to be able to kind of analyze and predict those events from occurring. Uh, so, so all of this, you know, to scope the problem with the, the, the kind of the quantity and then be able to kind of analyze these cases so that we can recognize to come up with a, come up with a plan. Um, the easiest solution would be if we had more money and more providers and, and, and uh, but we're not going to ever have those things. You know, we're not going to have enough money, we're not going to have enough providers. So we have to figure out how better to use, you know, our, what we currently exist to distribute the work and to better train those people that are 
interfacing with families at a point uh, before crisis occurs and let them understand a crisis is coming if we don't if we don't head off at that point in time. Great, thank you, Gary. All right, now we're going to start uh, a second round of questions. We're going to jump around a little bit, even though this next slide is not going to seem like it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next question is for for David. Um, how can we uh, in kind of uh, dovetailing off of what Gary just said about preventative services. How can we address a lack of preventative care so that individuals do not get to that crisis phase uh, that we're talking about, which is really the most expensive and has the least number of resources available once they hit that stage? Right, and there's been a lot of talk of, you know, advocating and getting funding for those expensive services tonight, I think, and I think um, Gary may have hit it on the head that we might have a service delivery system that's out of touch with the system's needs. Um, what that means and, and what kind of you know drastic changes we can make, we, we shall see. Um, but I think the, the best thing we can do for lack of preventative care is to fund it, right? <laughs> um, you know, we talk about funding you know very expensive services, but can we fund um, preventative care services? I mean, I think we can all think about um, on, on the medical side, you know, diabetes, heart disease, these are things that people know about. We know how to prevent them. We know what causes them. We know what the effects are. We know, you know, all these things that we've done a really good job of engaging in preventative care. Um, we need to do that with mental health. We need to do that with challenging, um, you know, behaviors, right? These externalizing behaviors. Um, I think uh, we do a lot of training as uh, I, I work at Sound Health when we have a, a crisis stabilization team, which is certainly has a reactionary component to it, but we really try to have a prevention component to it, getting out and doing a lot of education and talking to people on an individual basis about specific topics or, or we're t talking to bigger, larger audiences. The problem is, is that nobody is funded to come, right? Parents can't get there because there's no one to watch their children. Um, adult family home providers, which are a big um, uh, care component in our, in our area here in King County, um, they don't have anybody to man the house while they're gone. Um, they can't send staff because they can't pay them because they don't get paid if there's not individual contact. The same way with service providers. So usually we get a, manage, uh, a group of managers from like service provider agencies. Those are the people that are, are able to come. Um, but again, how does that, they, they don't have time because they're covering for staff people that they don't have. I don't, it, it's a whole thing about getting this information out. There's a lot of, I think, resources that have come through the county system around parent education. Um, and there's quite a few of them and great ones, just nobody can access them. And again, this is sort of that tool and appropriateness of the tool, right? Um, I mean, I think primary interventions are, are really, that, that's where we're trying to get to. Um, it, it's an ongoing issue. I think that any time you have the ability to educate somebody, whether it be, you know, there's people in this audience who, who know things, who've been through things, any time that you can talk to somebody, like Stacy mentioned with the parent-to-parent -parent program, um, we use a statement called, um, in the absence of teaching, learning still occurs. And so if we're not educating people, then people are just learning what they see here, right? And what they tend to see in places like emergency departments hospitals, primary care, is they see externalizing challenging behaviors is a part of intellectual and developmental disabilities, and that's not true, right? There are things that we talked about that are caused that, whether that be, you know, these stressful situations. If we can anticipate what those are, if we can figure out that those are things that cause problems, um, the medical components that we talked about, I mean, there's um, what we call the usual suspects, constipation, the, in those intensive units that, um, Eric talked about that are all over the nation. There was a study at one of them done by, I can't remember right now, but of the like 214 admissions that they had had in two years, 64% of the people on the unit had constipation. How many psych meds <laughs> does it take to, I mean, that could have also caused constipation, right? There's a lot of med side effects. We talked about changes um, and it was described this out of state program, which expensive, effective, really quality programs. Um, but people with complex intellectual, behavior, behavioral, and mental health needs have a lot of changes. They get a lot of restrictions. They get moved. They, uh, th these, are, these are challenging things, right? Um, and 
I work at Sound Health, which is a mental health organization, so I can't um, gloss over the fact that mental health issues are um, more common in people with intellectual developmental disabilities, primarily anxiety and trauma-related stressors. Um, I think uh, maybe if we were to start someplace, maybe we can educate primary care and emergency departments. If we're talking about like this tertiary care, if they understand the management of the person with intellectual and developmental disabilities when it comes into their setting, um, that might be a good place to start. Great, thank you, David. All right, we're gonna jump over to Beth Leonard. And uh, Beth, the question for you is, what are some possible systemic solutions that could improve the crisis response system for people with autism and intellectual and developmental disability? Great. Um, so I'm gonna quickly mention three things in the time that I have um, that the DD Ombuds is proposing as possible solutions. Um, the first is to determine the scope of the problem, and this really gets at the issue that Dr. Stobie was talking about a moment ago, is that we really don't have a good idea of how big this problem is across the state of Washington. So since uh, spring 2018, the DD Ombuds has received 50 separate complaints, about 50 separate individuals that have been stuck in hospitals due to this lack of crisis intervention. There's a large number and we are only responsive to complaints that we receive, right? So we can't see everything that's going on in the state. Um, people are ending up in these situations or experiencing these crises coming out of all different settings. Um, some are in residential support, some are living at home with families, and there to date is no good way of tracking that data throughout the whole system. Um, there are um, some attempts starting to be made, which is good progress, but until we fully know um, where people are coming from, what intervention is successful in the end, and where people end up and able to stabilize, it's gonna be very difficult to um, put money in the right place um, to make the right services accessible to everyone across the state. So that's our first request um, to everyone is that the, the scope of the problem, data be collected so we can actually see uh, where these uh, issues are happening and how they are uh, successfully alleviated when they are successfully alleviated. <coughs> Uh, the second is to, uh, again, I'm going to repeat what David just said. I'm just going to echo what the, my brilliant panel of fellow uh, panel members have said, uh, is to increase the capacity of service providers in the community. So I agree that starting with primary care um, and ER uh, physicians and medical staff would be very helpful if people had more um, capacity um, and training to work with people, developmental disabilities, that'd be really helpful. Um, we have encountered several situations where people ended up hospitalized because they had dental pain, um, uh, diabetes that was out of control, um, GI pain. So there's undiagnosed pain happening that's being attributed to their disability, um, and, and that's uh, unfortunately very common. Um, and then another thing we see is uh, med management issues where people are having uh, medication issues and are un unable to get stabilized, um, and their behavior is being attributed to their disability and not their change in medication. Um, and so if we had, uh, you know, I think it's, probably unlikely that every provider, in my dream, every provider would be a brilliant expert in working with people with developmental disabilities, but um, I think it would be helpful even if there was a network, a more um, robust network of uh, people to consult with across the state too, because we talk to people in rural settings that feel like they want to help but they don't, can't access or don't know who to call to help get consultation on how to um, assist their patient, so that would be helpful. In addition to that, uh, dentists is a big one. If uh, dentists that were able to work with people with developmental disabilities, particularly sleep dentistry, um, there's not a lot of access to that across the state. Um, and then sexual assault program advocates and other trauma pro program advocates um, able to work with people with developmental disabilities and also able to provide counseling and ongoing support for folks that don't communicate using verbal language. Um, is something we see. So people are unable to access that trauma counseling that they really need because there's not really a method of working with people that don't use verbal language. Um, in addition to that, the third thing I'll say is that there's a crisis of residential supports in the community. So many of the people that we work with after their hospitalization are seeking some kind of residential pr placement. So a long-term placement where they'll have staff support um, to help them uh, with skill building and also provide necessary supervision and other support during the day. Um, people that aren't in crisis can't get into residential support now, and people that are in crisis are, certainly can't. So we're seeing people wait six months to a year, um, wherever they are, to get into a residential placement. So we really need to fund residential service settings for people with developmental disabilities much more robustly so that when people are stabilized, they have somewhere to go um, and don't stay stuck in a situation that's inappropriate, which can cause another crisis on itself. 
Um, and it also takes up that space for someone else who needs that medical space or psychiatric space, um, as opposed to the person that's just stuck there holding the bed. Um, so those are three simple solutions. <laughs> Great, thank you, Beth. All right, our next question is for our zoo. Knowing what the current state of crisis services are, what do you see as possible solutions to improve these services? You know, how, are, how would these proposed solutions, why are they the right ones, and how should they be implemented? This is gonna be a repeat of what David said and what Beth said, but I strongly encourage us to focus on a full array of truly community-based services, including mobile and in-home crisis intervention. I think it's in sh um, we need to ensure that there is just-in-case and just-in-time behavior support in the plans, just in case a situation comes up. Also, just in time, access to someone that can talk you through what to do, what you should be doing in that situation, right after a cycle of escalation, also during a cycle of escalation, not the next week or the next month. Also, um, it's important to ensure that there are enough bodies to keep everyone safe. When there's multiple children in the household, it's really hard to keep everyone safe when you're outnumbered. Adequate respite care. Cross systems training to ensure consistency across environments. Service providers with expertise in IDD and mental health disabilities and other wraparound intensive in-home behavior supports. I also think enhanced fee-for-service payment arrangements for transitional care, transitioning from pediatric care to adult care for services is really important. In a fee-for-service world, it's very cha challenging to get service providers to adapt to uh, adopt new behaviors when they are not getting reimbursed. Enhanced fee-for-service could be structured in a variety of ways, using a higher fee for evaluation and management services for the purpose of incentivizing practices to accept certain volume of clinically complex um, clients with IDD and mental health disabilities. Another consideration is to look at contracts um, and insurance policies for providers to make sure there's nothing in the contracts that providers have with the state that allows them to unintentionally or otherwise discriminate against people with IDD and mental disabilities. This includes looking at insurance policies that providers have that often contain provisions that have a discriminatory effect on our clients. This is often the reason that providers have to refuse service to people with IDD and mental um, health disabilities. Finally, I think the advocacy needs to include um, expansion of existing Medicaid waiver services. Thank you. Great, thanks, Arzu. All right, Gary, this is uh, bouncing a question back to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the recently funded ECHO model for training and how it might impact crisis uh, and scaling up those services across the state? So uh, we did have some success at this uh, last legislative session. Uh, one example of success was getting uh, funding for uh, a program that we're gonna be launching, well, we've already started uh, development, but it will be officially launched this December, which is uh, ECHO Autism Washington. Uh, ECHO uh, stands for Extension of Community Health Outcomes. It was originally uh, kind of came from University of New Mexico, and it's basically it's it's not that brilliant, but it's yet it is brilliant. Uh, it, just using uh, teleconferencing um, technology-based uh, approach to allow for people like yourself that uh, have expertise on, let's say, how to handle a certain behavior, to uh, give uh, in current time real recommendations to a provider out in Wenatchee that doesn't have your expertise but wants to have it. Um, and they're able, uh, during these, we have these sessions that you, you've got kind of a Hollywood squares of providers meeting on this kind of tele teleconferencing platform and the providers present uh, 
actual real cases that are de-identified. Um, by de-identifying them, it allows the experts at the hub to give actual recommendations uh, to the provider in the, in the community. Um, the uh, adult learning for all of us is uh, impacted significantly if we have an emotional attachment uh, to what we're learning. So being able to present an actual case, um, you're gonna retain that information much more. And this is how in, medical, in the medical world we learn in the master apprentice method of, of teaching. You know, uh, I, I wasn't um, uh, born uh, with some extra skill to be a neurologist. I worked with neurology mentors, I presented enough cases, and then I get declared to be an expert in neurology, just because I do it over and over again, just like we all do with any, any type of job. Um, so this is an example of trying to redistribute knowledge uh, and, and get best practices into the hands of providers that, that, that are on the front line. And it's a way of, of addressing this uh, disparity of care uh, when, when, uh, when there's a scarcity of care because we don't have enough specialty providers to get that knowledge out into the hands. So we're focused on um, the uh, Centers of Excellence program that the Healthcare Authority has set up. Uh, Centers of Excellence program, uh, uh, primary care providers uh, can go through a training and get designated as a Center of Excellence so they can make a diagnosis uh, and provide care for children with autism. Um, and, but, and despite this excellent program, uh, providers just haven't had enough confidence, so we just haven't seen an, uh, enough knowledge getting out to these primary care providers that have raised their hands to be centers of excellence. So uh, we're really excited to uh, start to get more knowledge out to primary care providers throughout Washington State. Uh, we see this same solution um, for others, other types of specialties. So, Every, uh, Eileen Schwartz with the Herring Center is launching an ECHO program supporting uh, school districts that are hiring ABA providers. Um, University of Missouri, who we've uh, um, worked with closely on this, they're a couple years ahead of us, has launched uh, ECHO Crisis, supporting uh, emergency room providers. Uh, there's, a, there's an ECHO for school psychologists, uh, you know, so you can kind of think of every specialty. Um, at, uh, at the Autism Center, our feeding program, you know, kind of reaching out to those, those issues. So this is a, it's a great tool, it's a great solution. I think we're, we're going to see this expand. We're the type of state that, that needs this type of program. Um, and, you know, when you think about some of the, one of the things I wanted to say as I was kind of listening to the panel on the first set of questions, you know, with, with regards to the Healthcare Authority and DDA and, and, and the ARC, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's there, you know, and I'm a physician in a specialty clinic and I can't keep track of it uh, on how to help an individual family. If I can, how do you expect a family with one individual to learn and understand how to access these services? You know, so again, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we have, it's just getting that knowledge out into the field in a timely manner that can prevent crisis. Great, thanks Gary. All right, Gail, next question is for you. What work um, is the Healthcare Authority doing now to address the barriers to getting appropriate uh, preventative and crisis care for individuals with IDD and severe behavior? Okay, so I, I was just sitting here listening to us all and I was thinking if we all got in a room, we could solve so many problems because we all see it from the same point. Um, but it's really exciting this year um, because of the of the things that we're doing, the opportunities we've had to identify a need and how we're moving forward. And I'll start by answering the question by saying that DDA and, and the Healthcare Authority have partnered on case managing for cases that have been in the hospital too long. Hospital calls us, there's no wrong door. They've got my number. I swear it's on a bathroom wall someplace. <laughs> but. But th they have my number, they know how to get a hold of their DDA case manager, they can bump a case up to the headquarters level, we get on the phone, we get the managed care organization involved if, if they're the, the healthcare benefit administrator, and we're working on um, how to problem solve effectively to find the right place for this patient to go, 
What benefits do they need from our side of the house? How can we support them in the setting that they're going in? And we're effectively problem solving. Um, we're working with um, ERs that call us and providing the same service. We're working with parents that call us. We're working with case managers from the MCOs that bring it to our attention or for the DDA caseworkers that bring it to our attention. So there's been a lot of collaboration that we have built over the last eight months um, because the need just became so obvious that this was something that we needed to do. Um, happy to partner with Seattle Children's at any point in time to help address this question. Um, Eric and I have been partnering on developing a continuum of care for the treatment of autism. Um, we anticipate that some aspects of this may become a decision package for the session 21, because it's a longer session. Um, but we're looking at um, services that we could provide that would keep those children that I referred to earlier that are going out of state. How do we keep them in state in an inpatient setting? How do we provide that service at Seattle Children's? How do we create a partial hospitalization program as part of that continuum? And then community-based services program that would be more, you know, distributed across the state and then the home setting. And how do we pull that all together? It would be fluid. A uh, person wouldn't necessarily start at any given point. Uh, ch the child would be enrolled based on their needs. And um, we're excited about how that moves forward and talking about how we can, can build that. Um, I would offer to you that we did work with, with Gary on that ECHO training, and Stacy and I and, and DDA were at a, a meeting last session with the legislator, and we ended up with another $200,000. Um, to work on um, support, educational support for professionals, which would include the ER and physicians and dentists, um, whomever, you know, mental health providers. So um, we have that money available to us, so we'll be talking about how we spend that. Um, and then there's, there's some great committee work that's going on. Um, not at a legislative level, um, but in our agencies, cross-agency committee work. And so one of the committees that we have that, that um, Beth and I are on is a healthcare authority DDA, DDA ombudsman meeting that the ombudsman asked for in order to problem solve. And we said, sure, why not? Um, and so, um, and it's, it's just an example of how we're coming together to work on these issues. And that's what's exciting for me. Um, so where this group has identified, and it's key, the number one thing that came out this week as we worked on this, and we did our prioritization of initiatives that we had come up with, was the education of providers. And so that's why everybody sees it the same in regards to what the things are, what are the initiatives we need to take in order to help solve the problem that's at hand. Um, this would include, um, Provider education support, which gives us an opportunity to use that 200,000 that I was referring to a second ago. And then we're also, one of the key things we wanna do is develop a family education resource tool. So, so online, written, how to navigate. Um, so these are two of the initiatives that we expect to come out of this committee um, and to, that we will be working on um, to bring forth in the near future. Um, also there's a, a cross-divisional um, group that, that Beth and I are also on, where um, it's the HCA, the DDA, and, and the Division of Children, Youth, and Family Services, which is the division that's now responsible for dependencies, um, children who are in a dependent situation. Um, um, and we are working with them to, again, make recommendations to the legislature um, in a report that will, um, that will benefit the delivery of services for children who are dependent, but also how do we prevent a dependency from happening? So how do we keep that family from getting stressed? And, and what preventive services do we need to provide? How do we all work together to make sure they have access to the benefits? So that's something that we've clearly recognized we have a need for, and we're, we're putting our energy in that. 
Um, the legislature also has um, requested a couple reports. Um, again, people on this table are still <laughs> involved in a lot of this work. So there's a, a House Bill 1394, Section 10 of that bill. So when I say section, it means there's multiple requirements in that piece of legislation. But Section 10 is, requires a report from a committee which includes the Healthcare Authority, DSHS, the Department of Health, DCYF, Children's um, Medical Center. Um, the, there's a, a group of providers who serve um, clients with IDD, as well as advocates that are participating on this committee. Um, we will be working to develop a report that will make recommendations to the legislature and the funding required to, prov to identify the services that are needed for clients and families to support um, individuals as they discharge from the inpatient behavioral health treatment centers, which includes community hospitals as well as CSTC and the CLIP. Um, and we will be working on what's the staffing and the funding needed for those pro um, to provide the services that are appropriate to the different levels of, of services they need in facilities. And then what is the services that we need to help individuals transition from being a youth to being an adult? So that committee will be focusing on those needs. And then there's also um, Senate Bill 5432, which require um, section 1003, that's a really big bill, um, which requires um, a focus of the management of involuntary treatment and, the, and facilities and the beds for both adults and kids, um, children looking at, um, um, looking for input that is centered on preventing um, a involuntary placement, so prevention, and the occurrence um, of the need, and that report is due um, December 15th. The report that I was referring to in 1394 is due in July. A um, lot of legislative activity on this subject, and when Stacy says it's time to get involved if you're interested or if you have a need, um, this is the time because Beth and I were talking in the car on the way up. We have legislators' ears. Um, they are convening groups and having us come and talk what are you seeing? What do you need? Oh my goodness. Um, and we are filling their ears with conversations around what we have experienced in our roles, um, what we hear from our colleagues, and trying to share with them um, the heartfelt need here. Great, thanks, Gail. Are we okay to go a few more? Okay. Okay, all right, let's move on this next question is uh for beth crable can we uh can we expect gda to expand crisis services if yes what can uh, we do to help make this happen and if no in your opinion why and where should parents and advocates put their focus so everyone on this panel has the same shared goal everyone in this room and and watching online has the same goal to improve where we are today and I think the future is really bright, but um, it takes a long time to make meaningful change. We can change things quickly, but they wouldn't be the right change. They wouldn't be the, the change that you need. Um, this last legislative session was, was great for DDA. It was great for healthcare. It was great for mental health, but it's not enough. Um, I think everyone in the audience feels that and knows that, that even though some good things are coming, it, it's still not enough. Um, as Dr. Stobie said, more money, more stuff, more providers, it still doesn't fix what we have, so we have to think smarter. And I think all of us together, uh, we're all partners in many different groups. And we're thinking smarter and thinking creatively and getting best practices from other states, other countries, um, and learning and doing better. So, um, in the last legis legislative session, uh, DDA asked for an increase to residential provider rates, and we got it. And hopefully um, this will help reduce turnover, help retain staff, um, make some improvements in that area so that people become more stable in their, their homes so there isn't as much back to the hospital. Maybe they got unstuck and then they're going back. That's not good for anyone. 
Um, we asked for 14 new beds to create a group training home setting so that we could build our first step down or step up, as it sometimes is, facility in the state. We received six beds. Um, we asked for five more enhanced respite beds for kids, um, and we got all five. So um, we got other things too, but I think all of you know that there's probably more. If you can feel that there's a need, there's probably a need. And I think with partners like the DD Ombuds, Northwest Justice, um, the ARC, um, Seattle Children, Sound Mental Health, and Gail and I who are attached at the hip, um, we can do a lot of good, but there's a lot more work to do because I, I know these families, we feel their pain when this is not going well and we don't have any good answers on how to make it better because one person's child or it is in the hospital longer than they need to be is too many. And when we don't have a good answer on what comes next, um, it's really painful. Um, we offer case management services and our case managers, they're in it because they love this work and this has been a really hard hard time for them trying to support families with services that um, just aren't cutting it sometimes especially with the population we're talking about tonight that is very intense and parents are so committed to their kids and they're not asking for help often until things are really serious and you know so what what do we do then how do we do more preventive and then when it is really serious how do we help those families at that point so um this opportunity to speak tonight and um, be together with all of these people um it is just is just great for everyone and i hope um that folks will take their own opportunity um to speak up and share what they need because we need whatever the families need because we we work for taxpayers we're we're citizens here, we're in the state of Washington and you're our neighbors. Many of you are our family members um, that are in the same situation too. So um, that's what you can do, get involved. Too. Great, thanks Beth. All right, moving right along here. Elizabeth, this next one is for you. Um, can you discuss uh, the legal rights these families have to services and placement? Yes, thank you. Um, so, I just want to, uh, we at Northwest Justice Project, we represent uh, disabled uh, children or young adults, and there, people have a lot of legal rights that we can exercise on their behalf and, and sort of raise to the forefront. First of all, for Medicaid enrollees who are under age 21, there's the uh, EPSDT mandate, which is early and periodic screening, diagnosis and treatment. Oh, I hear little whisperings helping me. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so people who are up to age 21 are entitled to coverage for any service that is medically necessary, safe and effective, and not experimental. That's a really powerful uh, tool that that can be uh, waged for uh, people's needs that their uh, doctors and medical providers are saying that is medically necessary for them. Uh, the second uh, very important legal issue I wanted to emphasize is that um, all of what we're talking about is affects the civil rights of people with disabilities and um, the important protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, um, and that it was enacted to prevent discrimination against people with disabilities. We look at to that a lot and the landmark case of Olmstead, uh, the Olmstead case that, to, uh, that people are entitled to community supports to allow them to live in the least restrictive uh, setting. There's something called the uh, integration mandate. Yes, the integration mandate. So to live with uh, people who have disabilities and do not have disabilities to the best that they are able, so long as their treating medical provider agrees, 
and they themselves agree that they uh, want to live in the community and uh, it is possible as a reasonable accommodation for, for the state to do so. So that's uh, a second very important uh, uh, legal right that people have that we can, uh, you know, sort of just bring to the fore and um, exercise that right. The third is um, federal Medicaid law. So for recipients of Medicaid, um, there's a number of uh, assurances that the state uh, makes and um, that it, it, it guarantees that it will provide Medicaid beneficiaries uh, sufficient services to meet each individual's health and welfare needs. So I think we've heard a lot tonight about how um, the state wants to do that and uh, you know solutions to make that happen, but it's really important for people to bear that in mind and not feel hopeless that there aren't options. The other is the reasonable promptness uh, guarantee under federal Medicaid law, which is the, that in light of all the circumstances, people are entitled to receive medically necessary services with reasonable promptness um, and not undue delay. So um, that's, I just want to emphasize that there are a number of important uh, legal rights that people can exercise and uh, really get relief uh, through the law, which I guess I have to say as a lawyer, that's <laughs> all we do, but, um, but they're out there and I'm happy to talk more about it to anybody. Great, thanks Elizabeth. All right, and Stacy, you're gonna bring us home here. This next question and final question uh, of our panel is for you. This is kind of the call to action. So what, what can parents, advocates, providers, and uh, other concerned members of society do to get involved to affect change in the system? Sure, so as if you didn't have enough to do, because your parents right now have plenty on your plate and that's why you're here tonight, we're gonna um, help you see how powerful you actually are. Um, you know, most of you are familiar with special education at this point of your child um, at our school age. And special education didn't come about because the system said, oh, we got to do this. It's because parents got together, they got some good lawyers, they got some good experts, uh, and they told their stories. And um, I sit on a lot of panels, and tonight's panel is particularly exceptional. Uh, it is not frequent that you have heads of two departments like the Healthcare Authority and DDA here to speak to you very specifically about the, the work that they're doing. You have experts here from Children's Hospital, you have well, very skilled attorneys, um, you have clinicians. Uh, we're all talking about the same things and yet we haven't been able to solve the problem quickly enough. Um, and it is going to take all of you doing that. And it, it shouldn't surprise you that in this current political environment, you have to become civically engaged if you're gonna affect change. Um, and that means just taking a couple of extra steps. So um, joining a parent coalition, for example, um, allows um, organizations like the ARC uh, to be able to go to legislators and say, you know, we have a thousand families who have joined this and believe that we need change. Um, as a member of a parent coalition, you're gonna get notices that say, you know, it's time for you right now to call either your one senator or one of your two state representatives and just say, um, this bill is coming or this issue is up and I care about it. And they, believe me, they truly care about what you think. Uh, one phone call from you will matter to your state legislator. Uh, they count those phone calls. They figure that you represent a number of people that have a similar problem. Um, when you're voting, ask their candidates, what do you know about developmental disability? Um, how can I tell you about my family story? There's a couple of um, very specific events that will come up and one's coming the Monday before Thanksgiving um, is the, the King County Legislators Forum. In King County in particular, we have a lot of state legislators who sit in leadership positions, um, and they look forward to this Developmental Disabilities Issues Forum every year. We get between 500 and 600 families. Um, it's translated in about eight different languages. 
They, they learn all about developmental disability in one particular evening, uh, but they see your faces. And they will say it's one of the most powerful forums that they go to on any issue, any issue, you name it. Um, we get their attention at this particular forum. Um, so if you have any opportunity to come or to even just invite your legislator to attend, um, there's information about that on our website. Um, it happens to be at the Double Tree Cell Center every year. It's always the worst weather of the whole year, guaranteed to have snow, rain, or wind. Um, but everybody comes because it is the night where we make an impression. Um, I think, uh, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's a series right now that Austin Jenkins is doing on developmental disability and um, the uh, individuals stuck in hospitals. I know that the number of clicks that happen on that story will allow Austin to continue to do this series um, and will get the attention of legislators. So even if everybody who's on Facebook tonight clicks on that Austin Jenkins story about people with developmental disabilities being stuck in the hospital, and you just go to NPR, or KUOW, or um, KNKX. Uh, oh, you got it, okay. Just click on it. Everybody click on it. Keep clicking on it. Uh, because that story will get noticed. Um, Austin will continue to cover this issue, and he's very engaged in it right now. Um, and it will affect change. Uh, so I want to encourage everybody to please either join a parent coalition, come to the forum, or start communicating um, online, as we do now, uh, to really make change. Because uh, we have a saying at the ARC, those who show up make change. And it, it's time for you to show up if you want to make this different. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Stacey. And in addition to the NPR um, radio um, show, there's also the DDA, the DD Ombuds uh, report that has been mentioned throughout uh, also there to access. So. Um, just a few little slides here and we will conclude tonight. Uh, this has been said throughout, but I'll say it again. Uh, this is a legislative issue. Uh, please contact your elected officials as we've just been talking about as Stacey just ended so uh, nicely with that. Uh, it matters, so uh, please do that. Uh, there are uh, agencies here uh, like the ARC, uh, King County, ARC of Washington, uh, the DD Ombuds and WA Washington Autism Advocacy Alliance that are all agencies that are going to help you advocate and work with legislature and provide you guidance in this way as you uh, try to engage with the legislative process in this way so and then finally uh, we just want to have special thanks to those individuals living with crisis and the people who love them and try to support them uh, Thank you so much to the, to the panel members, uh, their dedication, commitment to the crisis services systems, quality of life for individuals with IDD and autism who are currently in need of crisis stabilization. Thank you guys all so much for coming tonight and uh, thank you all out there in, in the auditorium and online uh, for participating and watching and, and with us. We really appreciate everybody's support and thank you so much. Thanks.